Mistress. This is a bonus episode for Luftwaffe at Sea. This took a great deal of work to put together. I edited a lot of photos, went searching for a bunch of them. Most are relatively easy to find, but not in the greatest of resolutions, or the captions were inaccurate. Then there's colorization, with I always consider a great deal of fun, uh, even if it takes a lot of tweaking. I used an app for some, but uh, most of them are by hand, and even the ones that you use an app for, of course, you gotta go over with a brush again. But uh, I know you'll enjoy them because they are kind of unique photos that you don't see every day. As for the motion picture bits, there really is a gap in the literature when it comes to Italian newsreels that were preserved, but I gave my best bit. Uh, there are a few that may not be chronologically correct. Some are recreations, but you get the point. I even went through cheesy Greek 70s movies, so apologies for uh, any of the tackiness in some of the scenes, but I think you'll enjoy it. Anyway, it took me over a month to do this video, and I really look forward to uh, sharing this labor of love. So here we are in the Dodecanese Islands, which at the time had been Italian since before the Great War. Italy captured them from the Ottomans in 1912. During the 1914 conflict, the islands were used by the Italians, British, and French to strike at the Ottomans, and their role as a staging area continued in the Greek, Italian, and French campaigns on Asia Minor following the end of World War I. After the disastrous Greek defeats against the nascent Turkish Republic, the Italians negotiated to keep the larger of the islands, the 12 for which the chain is named, as well as some littler ones, while most of the other 90 or so islands went into Greek control. Now, to Mussolini, this was Italy taking back a proper part of the Roman Empire. To the Greek-speaking 95% of the islands and the Ladino-speaking minority, this was horse hockey. However, it was horse hockey with a lot of concrete behind it, as Mussolini Quadrum Vir, Cesare Maria de Vecchi, began to enforce a strict program of Italianization and started to turn them into his Aegean fortress. And that, of course, was complete with propaganda in every corner of the Italian media to promote how Italian these Greek islands were. Of course, just like in Tyrol and Libya, there was an attempt of moving populations, but colonization was really not all that successful. What was successful were the building projects. The harbors were modernized and militarized. The Regia Marina ensured that their motor torpedo boats and submarines could operate freely in the many deep harbors. And the alleged threat of Greece was challenged by the Italian Navy and Air Force. And there was this whole interwar thing between Greece and Italy that often led to military confrontations, especially in the late 30s. So De Vecchi was paving the way for that war with Greece and looking forward to making the Mediterranean an Italian lake. When the resounding Ochi came from Athens on the 28th October 1940, everything came to a head. After the embarrassments of the Italo-Greek War and the final surrender of Greece once the Germans got involved, Italian plans for expansion into the rest of the islands were nixed by Berlin in their attempt to keep the Greek puppet state's favor in a power move against the Duce who had drugged Germany into this unwanted Balkan conflict. Now, this did not mean that the Italians were not prepared to keep what was allegedly theirs. As the Allies stormed across North Africa, the Dodecanese remained a quiet sector of Italian occupation where Greek resistance was minimal and safety from the Allies was almost assured. It became a natural base for the Regia Marina and the Regia Aeronautica, as well as the Italian army garrisons, and they could train and strengthen their island fortresses basically without anybody else bothering them. That was not for long. Following the Italian armistice, the Allies feared the Germans would take the islands by force. And Churchill saw this as an opportunity to push once more for his plans on a soft underbelly attack of invading Europe via the Balkans, despite the fact that there had already been a successful invasion and capture of Sicily, Sardinia had been taken, and progress was being made on the mainland of Italy. More importantly, securing the area would be a serious step towards opening up the Black Sea route to convoys to the USSR, and towards pushing neutral Turkey towards siding with the Allies. Thus, within days of the king ousting Mussolini, the Italian forces on the Dodecanese, fearing an assault by the Germans, who were stationed in large numbers nearby, and rightly so, welcomed reinforcements as Commonwealth troops began to arrive on the 15th September 1943. The Germans had taken Rhodes in a mere two days, the 40,000 Italians on the key islands surrendering on the 11th September and Churchill was determined to strike back by taking Kos, Leros, and Samos. Kos and Leros, the north of the Deccanese Islands, 
would become two of the most important incidents in the face-off and go down as Germany's last real full victory over the Allies. Kos would also later become a scene of one of the most notorious examples of German war crimes, but that's for another day. Leros is a small island, infamous today for her history of hosting a notorious psychiatric hospital, the Colony for Psychopaths, and still famous for her village churches. She also boasts a war museum that, if you get a chance to visit, do take advantage of that. Um, there really is, and they do speak English there pretty often because of the tourists. Now, in 1943, she wasn't really well-known except for those interested in her strategic importance, and the value in her really came from the port of Laki. Laki is a valuable deep-water port with a protected harbor and was able to host a destroyer and several highly trained torpedo boat units and offered an excellent station for the Royal Navy and Royal Hellenic Navy vessels operating in the area. She was also a potential site for a sheltered harbor for submarines. With naval superiority backed by two squadrons of Spitfires, a small force of infantry and a handful of SBS men were considered sufficient to hold the island. The Allies had struck near the islands many times over, such as this bow fighter attacking a German ship near Kalimnosos, and the RAF felt that this would suffice to protect the Italians and British located there. This was a serious underestimation of German air power, and it flew in the face of what the Royal Navy should have learned with the loss of Prince of Wales and Repulse about sending ships into an operation without air superiority, or at least air cover. For against these spits was the 10th Spielier Corps. Based on the Greek mainland and in Crete, this was a vaunted outfit with experience in the Phony War, the Battle of Britain, the North Sea Naval Campaign, the African Campaign, the whole assault on Malta, and the 10th Flieger Corps was a force to be feared by Allied sailors. Now, in Part 4 of Luftwaffe at Sea, she's covered in brief, but you know this is really why this episode is its own, and why it's a bonus episode, because the 10th Flieger Corps is essential to understanding these battles. Now, the Germans were well aware of the British ideas about invading Yugoslavia and Greece, and the 10th Flieger Corps, led by General der Flieger Walter Bernicke, was, although bothered by Allied fighters in many areas, kept busy harassing any Allied naval and merchant assets in the range of their bombers. As the Allies came into the Dodecanese, the Luftwaffe was more than prepared for this threat. On 13 September, the 234th Infantry Brigade and supporting elements had taken Leros, combining their forces with those of the Italians. That same morning, the Special Boat Service captured the airfield at Kos and other key areas, giving No. 7 Squadron of the South African Air Force a home at Antimachia that evening. Potential interception by the Luftwaffe was taken care of when German aircraft on roads were neutralized by 38 Ninth Air Force B-24 Liberators that afternoon. The reinforcement of Kos was secured the next day, as 120 men of the 11th Paras were dropped onto a straw-laden landing zone and greeted by welcoming Loyalist Italian troops. However, Allied confidence was about to be shattered as the Germans were determined not to let the Italians keep the island chain. Kos, a hilly island with plenty of hiding spaces, was home to AA guns of the RAF regiment as well as those of the now co-belligerent Italians. With the Spitfires of No. 7 SAAF squadron above and the flak below, the Germans were in for a fight. Unfortunately, the Allies were vastly outnumbered in the skies and No. 7 Squadron was reduced to only four operational aircraft by the close of day thanks to the German use of cluster weapons loaded with SD-2 anti-personnel submunitions. These were the infamous butterfly bombs. Kos had to be reinforced that evening by 7-4 Squadron RAF. Just then re-equipped with Mark 5C Spitz, No. 7-4 Squadron had been carrying out an interdiction campaign against German installations on Crete and was familiar with the area and their enemy. With over 350 German aircraft at the ready against handfuls of Allied resistance, a battle for the Dodecanese would be a naval campaign largely determined by who controlled the air, a rarity outside the Pacific Theater, and one for which 7-4 Squadron was not prepared to fight. The Allies' efforts were further hamstrung by the American refusal to participate in the attack and the withdrawal from Cyprus of RAF and American fighter units. This included the 14th Fighter Group's Alexandria-based P-38s, which restationed themselves in Tunisia, joining the 14th's other squadrons to cover Italy. This is far from the Aegean and what Alan Brooke, the chief of the Imperial General Staff, had termed a campaign rooted in Churchill's Rhodes Madness. Only a small number of the P-38s from the 14th Fighter Group's 37th Fighter Squadron were flown into Libya from Tunisia, 
to participate in the battle, as well as some from 94th Fighter Squadron. The German base in Rhodes may have been knocked out for the moment, but air bases on Crete and the Greek mainland were a much more serious threat to ships and troops operating far from this Allied air support. Marisa on Rhodes would become operational within weeks, and the Allies were forced to cease bombing activities, the importance of the Italian campaign overshadowing the Dodecanese. An offer of surrender under honorable conditions had been rejected by the British and Italians on 13 September. The Germans then focused on retaking Kus. This began with air raids on the 17th against that island, and on the 26th they began a 50-day air assault against Leros. In the weeks leading up to the landing on Kus, the island was softened by BF-109s and U-88s. The Italian and Commonwealth assets on Kus were also the target of precision strikes by U-87 Stukas in what was one of the last great hurrahs of the once-feared dive bomber. Allied anti-air assets, fuel, supplies, and troops were under attack with few defenses, and, as far as my research could tell, no radar installations to offer warning. The Luftwaffe was showing off its prowess and offering good news in contrast to that coming from the collapsing Eastern Front and the constant peal of air raid sirens from the mind-shattering 24-hour Allied bombing campaign on the continent. It was a victory that Germany needed. The Italian Corregidor of the Aegean, as Mussolini had termed Leros, was going through much of what the Philippine Corregidor had. Supplies dwindled, the harbor and other naval assets were heavily damaged, and the anti-air defenses were softened with each strike, some being destroyed, some being hidden in mountain crevices. Meanwhile, Allied headquarters kept themselves in the bunkers deep underneath the mountains, first built by the Italians in the 20s and 30s. Reinforcement was out of the question as Luftwaffe sunk British and Greek naval assets in Laki, as well as those ships sent to reinforce the Commonwealth troops and Italian royalists. This was turning into a massive Allied defeat in a nearly forgotten corner of the war against a Luftwaffe that was presumed broken and distracted, all in a campaign of dubious strategic merit. The Royal Navy had successfully intercepted the heavy landing craft intended for the invasion, but this only postponed the inevitable and German light transports were soon making their way to Kuz from their concealed positions dispersed among the innumerable small islands of the area. Even fleets of small kaikia, the traditional Aegean fishing craft, were used to put boots on sand. The British had counted on the Royal Navy's light cruisers and destroyers to carry the day, but the war in the air seriously hampered Allied attempts at naval superiority and what small successes the Allies did have had unwittingly cost the lives of thousands of Italian and Greek POWs. On 23 September, HMS Eclipse sunk the Gaetano Donizetti and her torpedo boat escort, together with over 1,600 Italian POWs on board. On the 26th September, the day that large-scale operations began, the Luftwaffe's U-88 sunk the Greek G-class destroyer Vasilis Saloha, together with HMS Intrepid a British I-class destroyer, both while sitting in Laki in Leros. The Royal Italian destroyer Uro was sunk on the 1st of October. The German path to Kuh was clear. The German Unternehmen Eisbär, or Undertaking Polar Bear, commenced with the landing on Kuss in the early morning hours of 3 October. The German objectives were that the 22nd capture the city of Kuss, and the 22nd and the Brandenburgers come together to capture the airfield at Antimachia as quickly as possible. Antimachia is appropriately named since it means fight against, and it boasted a small town as well as an ancient castle and a more modern airbase. They planned to land the main force along the northern coast, cutting the, the city of Kos from the mountain airfield and settlements on the southern coast and the Kefalos Peninsula, as well as smaller landings on the isthmus connecting Kefalos to the rest of the island, and at the coast across the mountains from Ku to capture the mountain passes, cut off the Cape of St. Focas, and cordon off possible escape routes. Landing before dawn at 0430 hours, the fleet of 10 vessels unloaded the 22nd Airland Infantry Division and the Brandenburger Regiment's Amphibious Battalion. These were known as the Kustenjäger. Stukas struck simultaneously as troops, armored cars, infantry guns, and light artillery all landed. As soon as dawn arrived, at approximately 06.30, air attacks commenced. Four bowfighters of 4-6 squadron engaged the German ships. 
They would lose one bowfighter on the return leg, crashing off the Turkish coast and costing the squadron their CO, Wing Commander Rudd. Just after 0700 hours, three 227 aircraft did likewise, losing one aircraft in the fray. A third Allied attack began at 0830 when 7252 Squadron bowfighters went after the anchored ships, sustaining damage to four aircraft and damaging the commandeered transport Cita de Savona. At 0900 hours, the sound of 18 Stukas was heard over the Italian artillery and Durham Light Infantry positions west of the city of Cud near Platani. Only minutes later, the DLI found their A Company dislodged from their positions by the 22nd Division's 65th Grenadier Regiment, suffering over 50% casualties. Digging in with the still largely intact 10th Regimento de Fanteria, the Stukas had cost them the artillery support that had been holding the Germans back. By noon, 1,200 Germans were on course together with their equipment. Paratroopers of the Brandenburger Regiment landed as the British fought to keep an orderly retreat, pulling back to positions in and around the city of Kurs itself. The British infantry fought hard along the route to Kurs in an attempt to contain the beachhead, but coordinated air attacks supported a series of pushes by the 22nd in the afternoon. The Luftwaffe added to the chaos by striking at the Durham Light Infantry's positions in an olive grove south of Platani at 1730 hours. As seen in these photos that I restored and colorized, German troops of the 16th Grenadier Regiment had snuck forward and tossed flares at the British positions. This was all that the three circling Stukas overhead needed to put bombs on target, strafing them at leisure as they were now without heavy weapons or anti-air assets. This forced a retreat to bunkers and fortified positions along the road to Kurs only to be intensely mortared into submission before retreating once more. By 1800 hours, the Allies were contained within the city of Kuth and on Kefalos, and the mountain passes and roads to the city all cut off. The great classical capital of Antimachia, its airbase, and the ancient castle were overrun as resistance collapsed in the face of an attack by two sides. Paratroopers had advanced along the southwest road, together with Kustenjäger, and from the northeast, the advancing, reinforced 22nd Infantry had closed in. Weary from Stuka and U-88 attacks, their equipment largely hors de combat and their ammunition exhausted, the RAF Regiment and Safi Airmen, special boat service operators and Italian soldiers and sailors, could not hold out against the well-supplied Germans. By sundown, there were 4,000 Germans on the island, and the British and Italians used the advantage of night to assemble their defenses as best they could. On Kefalo's point, the Italians of the 50th Division were still fighting fiercely and holding back the Custaniega, making them pay for every foot with artillery, mortar, and small arms fire. While airborne reinforcements bolstered German numbers, they were not set to advance over the rocky terrain in the dead of night. Likewise, the Allies in Kuh had secured their perimeter, and the Germans did not want to risk the inevitably heavy losses of fighting street to street, especially at night. In the evening, the Allies tended their wounded, discussed the situation, and attempted evacuation arrangements, as futile it all might seem. When darkness fell, many took to rafts and small boats or even swam to Turkish waters to escape capture. These men would be interned, but they would escape the fate of those who remained. A final push in the pre-dawn light was all it took to find the fortified positions emptied of troops. Ignorant of the degree of the British withdrawal from the town itself, the Germans thought the Allies had dug in for a street fight. Taking off that morning from Crete, Rhodes, and the mainland, the Luftwaffe put every plane in the air against the island in a strike at 0800 hours. Nearly 60 Stukas dove down on the town of Kos, dropping their bombs where they pleased and strapping both civilian and military targets in the harbor and city. DO 217s and U88s focused on the Italian positions in Kefalos targeting the Italian artillery that had kept the Germans pinned down the previous day and awake through the night. At 
At 0900 the next morning, the island was captured together with the British and Italian commanders. Gapalos would be taken at 1400 hours. The only area left offering resistance was along the coast at Aia Focas. It was here that the Durham Light Infantry Rear Guards and Italian Infantry had held their ground. They would be cleared by 1800 that afternoon. Most of the day was spent rounding up prisoners. 1,388 British and 3,145 Italian troops, sailors, and officers were counted among those now in German hands. Total German losses from both the Army and the Luftwaffe were 15 dead and 70 wounded. The surrender would be made infamous for the massacre coming when the Italian commander, Colonel Felice Lerio, and a hundred of his officers were gunned down by German troops. This was an act that would add to the massacres of Greeks and Italians that cost Müller his day in a Greek court and for which he would pay with his life. The victory was not merely an opportunity for inhumanity, but a victory with an important tactical and strategic significance. The assault was a notable military victory for the Germans that cut off the Italians and British on Lero and other northerly islands, while demonstrating to the Allies that the Luftwaffe still had a full set of teeth and was ready to take on the remaining Italian forces in the area and any Allied reinforcements that had been rushed in to assist. In the air, Leros's defenders faced two groups of 33 operational U87D3s each from Stotzkampfgeschwader 3, the first group from Meara and second group from Maritza and Rhodes. Supporting them were ME109s out of Crete and the U88s of the second group Kampfgeschwader 51 recently restationed at Thessaloniki. Against them stood a handful of Italian Kant Z501 flying boats left sinking in the harbor or retreating to Lipsi, a tiny sparsely populated island not far from Patmos. Another German weapon that hadn't been used to effect in some time was also going to participate in the Battle of Lero, the Fallschirmjäger. While the Brandenburger powered troops had seen combat at Kors and would be used again, Lero would be one of the Fallschirmjäger regiment's last airborne operations of scale. On the waves, the Allies mostly tried to resupply the islands in the north using destroyers and light cruisers. Otherwise busy supporting the bombing campaign over Italy, the Army Air Forces and RAEF could only afford to have the 14th Fighter Group, assigned by Fighter Command, assigned to protect the retreating task forces, led by cruiser HMS Carlisle, supported by British destroyers Panther, Petard, Rockwood, and the Greek destroyer Maiolis, sailing from Alexandria to Scarpanto and German-occupied roads to shell positions and reinforce the northern islands. Moving from San Marie du Zit in Tunisia, the aircraft flew out of Gambot in Libya near Tobruk for these missions. It would soon be the aircraft of the 10th Luftflotte versus the 14th Fighter Group and RAF light bombers out of Alexandria. The insufficiency of these assets would show on 9 October when the retreating convoy led by Carlisle would experience a bloody encounter with the Luftwaffe. On the morning of the 9th, Major William Leverett had led two flights of P-38s from the 37th Fighter Squadron to rendezvous with the Carlisle's convoy at midday, relieving P-38s of the 94th Fighter Squadron. Leverett's flight lost two P-38s who had to turn back after developing engine problems, leaving him with seven fighters divided into two flights, four led by him and a second flight of three fighters. As the flights arrived over the ship, Stukas and a single U-88 were beginning their dive on the vessel. Panther took a beating and was sinking quickly, while Carlisle was crippled, as seen here, all before the P-38s could get themselves within firing range. As the Germans pulled out of their dive, all seven lightning struck simultaneously. Without any fighter escort, the American fighters had their way with the Germans. The dogfight was fierce as the bombers' gunners tried to defend themselves and pilots dipped and twisted to fight off the P-38s, but as most stories of unescorted Stukas ended, it was to no avail. Americans claimed 16 German aircraft, including 15 Stukas and the U-88, with seven going to Major Leverett and five to Lieutenant Harry Hanna. Three and a probable were claimed by Lieutenant Homer Sprinkle, and a single Stuka was claimed by Lieutenant Robert Margeson. Another was lost to AA fire from the ships. In truth, Stotzkampfgeschwader 3 lost only eight aircraft, but that was still a tremendous loss. Unfortunately, this was to be the sole real Allied air victory of the campaign. 
and even then it was at the cost of a valuable destroyer and a bow fighter of 252 Squadron, accidentally shot down by Lieutenant Wayne Blue when his three P-38s mistook them for U-88s after the fracas with the Stukas. With the withdrawal of naval forces, the 14th Fighter Group returned to Tunisia and resumed patrolling over Italy and the Western Med, leaving the Luftwaffe with clear skies over the Aegean. One aerial adventure worth noting is that of the night of Sunday, 17 October. The trawler Hedgehog, ferrying supplies to the long-range Desert Patrol's M2 patrol on Astapalia, where they were watching for German aircraft, was to return to Lero on 14 October with 50 German prisoners captured when the Olympos convoy had been attacked. Hedgehog developed engine problems and in the dawn hours of 16 October was picked up by the submarine HMS Surf and taken under tow for repairs at Levita. Forced to abandon Hedgehog when a Luftwaffe seaplane flew low over the pair, Surf resurfaced to see Hedgehog operational and no longer needing a tow. Now unescorted, Hedgehog reached Levita only for the prisoners to overwhelm their captors and take control of the small island. That Sunday night, Oberschleutnant Obschatz of the 15th Company, 4th Regiment of the Brandenburgers, was sent to rescue the POWs and return them to the German-held mainland. On the morning of the 18th, two U-52 seaplanes from St. Hanfloch-Tafel 1 and a Dornier Dio-24 flying boat from St. Lodge-Tafel 7, together with six Arado 196s, three as escorts and three flying before the others as recon, departed Athens with a team of Brandenburger commandos led by Obschatz and landed off the coast of Levita. Two Arados strafed and bombed the wireless station, killing two Italians held there in their work to prevent word from getting out about the operation. As the men prepared dinghies for the trip to shore, a single fall from Jaeger would become the only casualty that day when his boat collapsed and he was held under the weight by supplies, ammunition, and equipment. Within the space of five hours, the men had captured the island and its small airstrip, capturing eleven Italians and taking custody of Hedgehog's crew, who were already taken prisoner. With the arrival by air of the 11th Company of the 21st Luftwaffe Jäger Regiment, part of the 11th Luftwaffe Feldivision, the evacuation began, the last Brandenburger leaving the next day. Three days later, the Brandenburgers would carry out an air-sea landing involving seaplane-landed men, as well as a parachute assault against the island of Astapalea. Freeing another 48 prisoners and taking control of the island by 1,400 hours, they captured long-range desert group men on the island, as well as Italians. In an attempt to retake Levitha, rescue their mates, and re-establish a forward observation post, the type necessary to counter air superiority, 50 hastily trained desert patrolmen took off for Levitha and two motor launches on the 23rd. These elite men were used to hit-and-run tactics, operating in small groups with specific objectives, and typically operating in groups no larger than a platoon. This was a totally different animal. The MTB crews, as somehow ordered, fired at anything that moved, ruining the surprise of the night landing. The men hid their dinghies, unloaded their mortars, moved their supplies inland, and started to take up positions. One group, led by Rhodesian Captain John Olivy, moved towards the Italian weather station, thinking it would be the German headquarters. Olivy found it abandoned, and there were so few Germans on the island in the first place, they saw no opposition. In fact, the Germans were on another hill overlooking the cove, something they felt was a much more important target. The second group, led by New Zealander Lieutenant James Sutherland, approached from the southern spit that protected the port, using the mountains for cover just as the Germans had done in their approach on the airstrip, village, and port. As daylight dawned, the men were in full view of the Germans. Arado 196s and Strukas on the island took off, and a handful of Luftwaffe light infantry ran amok among the elite veterans. Bombers diving down on them time after time again, and small arms fire pinning them down. Groups sent on patrol returned to find the weather station captured by the Germans, and themselves taken into custody. The mission was a total failure. Before supper, the remaining men surrendered and were taken prisoner. Only seven of the 49 long-range desert group men were evacuated by motor launch that night. The Allies lost a valuable early warning post, and the Luftwaffe had once more carried the day, embarrassed the British, and cost the British some of the best men in the entire army. The night of 18 October would involve another incident that cost the Allies the lives of their own men, when Wellington's of 38 Squadron torpedoed the Sinfra, taking down with her almost 2,000 Italian and Greek POWs. 
Now this part actually took a lot of research and there's a lot of confusion here. For many years it was said that bow fighters and Mitchell sank Sinca. However, intelligence reports from both sides indicate that it was a torpedo attack at night that did the job. That night, the only torpedo attack launched was by Wellington's of Number 38 Squadron. The bowfighters and Mitchells reported bombing and strafing smaller targets, but none the size of the Sinfra, and they had no operations at night, according to the war diaries for the 321st Bombardment Group. German recollections clearly state the alarm was sounded at 23.30 hours, followed by a torpedo strike, likely that of Sergeant John von der Bolt. What is more important here is that the Italians were locked in a hole. Now, the ship exploded, and to add to this, there was a load of ordnance on board, but what made it a real terrible war crime and just a, an absolute massacre was that the guards tossed hand grenades into the holds to ensure that the, quote, Badoglio Italians, as they called them, would not escape. They then locked the doors again. Those not killed outright would drown, fittingly taking their tormentors with them into the Aegean. War crimes aside, it was still another incident of friendly fire that could have been avoided. The Kriegsmarine would report over 6,000 POWs, mostly Italian, but including British, Greek, and Commonwealth troops, lost nearly all to friendly fire. For weeks on end after the fall of Kuhl, Lero continued to sustain heavy German bombardment. The island boasted 13 heavy batteries of coastal artillery, a dozen heavy dual-purpose flak guns, dozens of heavy AA machine guns, and a smattering of light machine guns. However, these were nearly all exposed to air attack, and had either been destroyed, hidden from enemy fire, or rendered hors de combat. Nocturnal supply missions by destroyers operating at the maximum extent of their fuel range barely provided the island with sufficient supplies. German mines cost HMS Herworth and HMS Eclipse, and severely damaged the Greek hunt-class destroyer Adrias. Adrias and Herworth were off Kalimnos on a supply dash to Leros when Adrias struck a mine. Herworth rushed to her aid and was then split in two by another mine, claiming 133 souls in 15 minutes that it took to sink her. Adrias, without her prow, barely limped back to Alexandria. Eclipse was sunk by a mine east of Kalimnos while carrying men of A Company, 4th Battalion of the Buffs, losing 134 troops and 119 of her own complement of 145 sailors and officers. And the war in the air was in part responsible for these losses. The German mine layer, Shift 50, formerly called the Drache, had been laying mines only a day before they had struck Herworth and Adrias. Had responsible screening been carried out by the RAF and U.S. Army Air Force, the large-scale mining operations by the Kriegsmarine would likely have been noticed. However, without the strength to counter German air superiority, and without the effort put into even minimal reconnaissance of the area, the Royal Navy and the Royal Hellenic Navy were left fighting blind. In spite of losses, the Allies did manage to bombard Kos and Kalimnos, and more importantly, they had successfully disrupted the heavy transport vessels intended for Operation Leopard. The Germans knew their time was precious and resources vulnerable, but the odds were still on their side. The invasion of Leros, delayed as it might be and now named Operation Typhoon, was inevitable. On 11 November, the Luftwaffe struck again. A trio of HMS Petard, HMS Rockwood, and the Polish destroyer Krakowia had failed to locate the invasion fleet in the days prior to the invasion. Having shelled Kalimnos Harbor, they now turned towards Lero in an offer of artillery support and bombardment against the inevitable German beach landings. Just off Kalimnos, they spotted a German landing craft and two caiques loaded with troops. Attacking them was a pyrrhic victory in that it told the Germans where to find them. Having decided to return to Alexandria after their engagement, they soon saw Dornier Do 217E5s of Kankeshvara 100 overhead, and when they were halfway between Syra and Kandalusia, west of Nisiros, they blew off a weapon that was largely unknown at the time. The Germans had deployed aboard these Dorniers the Henschel HS-293 radio-guided bomb. The assault on 11 November crippled HMS Rockwood, rendering the Hunt class es escort destroyer hors de combat when the bomb tore through the hull and exploded in the galley's frozen stores. While HMS Blancasra was able to tow her back to Alexandria, she would be written off as a loss. That night, British Yard Minesweeper 7-2 would also be sunk by an HS-293 bomb in a strike on Leros's Alinda Bay. It was very clear who was in charge of the Aegean and the skies over it.
In the early hours of 12 November, Italian torpedo boats at Alero finally spotted the invasion flotilla. The German army invasion force was approaching in a pincer assault designed to cut the island in half. Commanded by Army General Leutnant Friedrich Wilhelm Müller, two infantry battalions of the 22nd Infantry Division, and a detachment of the Brandenburg Division's amphibious commando company, the Küstenjäger, swarmed the beaches, just as at Kos. While all army forces were, as at Kos, under Müller's command, joining them was the Luftwaffe's 1st Battalion, 2nd Fallschirm Jäger Division, led by Hauptmann Martin Kühne. Kühne had overall command of all Luftwaffe troops and would also act as the main tactical commander in the days coming. Facing them were Contramiralio Luigi Mascherpa, recently promoted by Supervarina as not to fall under British command, and his force of an infantry battalion, two heavy machine gun companies, a large coastal artillery force, and approximately 5,000 technicians, harbor workers, maintenance workers, and recently sworn in former civilian employees. Joining Mascherpa were Major George Jellico, son of the famous Admiral, and Colonel Turbel, as well as Major General Frank G. Arbitorius who, being of diplomatic mind, immediately declared himself in command of all Italian and British forces. Friction aside, there were 3,000 men of the Royal Irish Fusiliers 2nd Battalion, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Maurice French, the 4th Battalion of the Buffs, led by Lieutenant Colonel Douglas Agolden, and a force under Brigadier Robert Tilney, who led the 1st Battalion of the Kings on Lancasters, and elements of the 2nd Battalion of Queens on West Kent. A small remnant of the long-range desert patrol was also found on the island. The Germans were assaulting a force nearly four times their size, dug in, prepared, and in rough terrain. The landings began at dawn as the men hit the beaches and found themselves quickly under fire by determined foes. Held up for hours at the Orna Bay, they faced fierce fighting from the Italians and British. With two dozen batteries still intact, the Germans faced over 40 naval guns facing to sea, together with 58 heavy flak guns and 49 flak guns of lighter calibers, which could be turned to attack ground targets to devastating effect. A large number of batteries had been taken out over the past days, but a large number still remained. This delay forced a postponement of the airborne assault until the afternoon. At 1400 hours, Fallschirm Jaeger dropped out of the skies from 40 U-52s and onto the craggy peaks of Mount Raki, cutting the island in two. When the U-52s approached the island, Mount Raki's height and the plans for the low-level drop combined to make the landing difficult, this did not stop them from accomplishing their goals. The first company, led by Oberleutnant Haza, was used to cut off the roads and communication lines on the north of the island. Oberleutnant Felmer's Sentinel Company and Oberleutnant Müller Astheimer's 4th Company took the island's isthmus, connecting forces at Oyorna and Alinda Bay, and establishing regimental headquarters. The third company, under Oberleutnant Raba's command, blocked the roads to Lero and swept north from the Bay of Alinda against Allied positions. The U-88s and U-87s that struck late that morning had disrupted the Allied gunners, and while British reports claimed they had taken out around 40% of the paratroopers in their landing stage, the number hit was actually only around 10%, and most were incapacitated by ground fire or in injuries from landing on jagged, giant Greek mountains. We Helens are a hardy people for a reason, and I guess German ankles aren't made for it. Not that that has ever dissuaded tourists from the area. By dawn the next day, the area was considered secure. The 13th was spent shoring up communications lines, liaising with the 22nd Infantry, recovering dropped equipment, collecting prisoners, and watching helplessly as a Fallschirm company of the Brandenburg Division was pummeled by Allied fire. A storm had hit that morning, and two of their transports were lost, as well as several troops who were dropped into Alinda Bay, where guns hidden in concrete bunkers opened up on the survivors. The Germans were stopped in their tracks, but had successfully cut the island in two. Bunkers and pillboxes pinned down their infantry and airborne troops, and it was time for the Luftwaffe, so far most useful at keeping the Royal Navy out of daylight sorties and preventing resupply, to put to use her air superiority and once more be the flying artillery she had been in 1939 and 1940. Stukas bombarded Allied positions, especially the fortified Manto Meraviglia, or Imerovili, in the southeast of the island. Strike after strike, they hit the helpless target, but it was not enough to overcome the Allies. BF-109Gs and u 88 strafe targets and tried to take out the machine gun nests and flak guns hitting the men on the ground, but there was little success. While air strikes and machine guns on the ground had covered the entrances to the mountain fortress, the troops themselves were dug in too deep and protected by too much concrete and soil for the Stukas to affect them. 
On the 13th, another Hunt-class destroyer, HMS Dulverton, was lost to HS-293 armed DO-217s when one of their guided bombs struck her bridge. Dulverton would be finished off by a torpedo from HMS Belvoir. The campaign was becoming an unbearable and tragic embarrassment to the Royal Navy. On the morning of the 14th, the Germans woke up to intense fire from HMS Echo and Belvoir, but after an hour, the ships retreated, fleeing the Luftwaffe's ever-present threat. On the ground, the Luftwaffe's Fallschirmjäger companies planned a mass assault against Medavidia, even using a captured 10.5cm flak gun to attack the fortress, albeit with a sledgehammer to operate the firing pin and with improvised sights. Points for creativity. Not all the Allied attempts to destroy their equipment were for the better, though. The naval intelligence officers at Medavili burned their codebooks during the German assault. From now on, all British communications had to be in plain language, easily accessible to the Germans. On the 15th, the Luftwaffe once more struck at the island in support of a mass assault from the Medavili's east and north, the Fallschirmjäger having successfully maneuvered out of Mount Rocky. The British, not knowing this, would lead an assault against Mount Rocky on the 16th, only to find it abandoned, and losing Monte Meraviti in the same day. Brigadier Robert Tilney would surrender at 1,700 hours on the 16th. While the entrenched Italians and Commonwealth forces fought off the Germans in several locations on the rocky island, the 360-degree assault broke down what was left of their resistance nearly everywhere, and, knowing it was futile to continue the fight, those close to Axis lines surrendered. Those near the shore sought evacuation. The Germans accepted the surrender of 3,200 British and Commonwealth troops, as well as 5,350 Italian co-belligerents, mostly all from Regia Marina. The Germans had suffered only 520 killed and wounded, nearly all from among the army troops. Luftwaffe units lost only 68 Fallschirmjäger in the operation, plus two who later died from their wounds while in hospital. It was clearly air power that turned the tide at Lero. Even if there were no surgical strikes as on Kul, it was the suppressive value of aerial bombing that kept the Allies pinned and the fear of airstrikes that neutralized the Royal Navy's operational capacity. The Luftwaffe flight logs show a constant flow of missions against the island at nearly every hour of daylight. Fallschirmjäger diaries and recollections also speak highly of the close support mission's importance particularly in the memoirs of hardened veterans of Africa, Italy, Russia, and Greece, such as those of Major Martin Kuna. Kuna, at the time a Hauptmann and in overall command of airborne operations, remarked how the lack of artillery and heavy weapons was a serious threat to success on the island. The 22nd Luftland Infanterie Division was designed to be air mobile, not in the modern sense, but in the sense of rapid deployment by airlift and delivery by gliders or transports, even transports landing under fire. Few armored cars were available, and none had made it inland until after the surrender. They would have been chewed apart by the Italian guns had they ventured into the mountains, and were only useful in securing coastal areas. A handful of light artillery pieces were available. Heavy and light mortars, 75mm Gebirgschutz 36s. You see these in photos, and unless I'm missing some, or they're just not appearing in the records, it looks like they did not have any recoilless rifles. Despite their obvious usefulness in the situation, and the fact that the Fallschirmjäger were really the first serious users of heavy recoilless rifles, the Allies and Italians had the advantages of numbers, artillery, machine guns, resources, fortifications, and familiarity with the island. Only resupply was an issue, and with the Luftwaffe commanding the skies, there was no way around that. The Italians had been preparing for an assault on Lero for over 20 years, and it was not going to be easily taken. In all ways, the Germans should have lost, but largely because of the Luftwaffe, they did not. Airstrikes continued to support the troops, and while the final blow began with the Kriegsmarine's delivery of reinforcements and heavy equipment from Athens on the night of the 12th and the 13th, this was only the beginning of an end, and most of this equipment never left the shoreline. The battle was fierce and hand-to-hand -hand in many places, and it took four days for the Allies and Italians to surrender, but the end was inevitable. The Luftwaffe's victory was complete. Combined air-sea-land operations, complete with amphibious, commando, and airborne assaults, had brutally swept away the British hopes of capturing the vital island. 
The Italian pride of the Aegean was now in German hands. The defenders captured or brutally massacred in cold blood. Greek, Italian, and Commonwealth sailors, marines, and troops lay at the bottom of the Aegean as Berlin once more showed that they were not yet defeated. Patmos, Pornoi, and Icaria fell by the 18th of November, and with that the Germans completed their conquest of the Dodecanese, only surrendering the islands after the general surrender on 8 May 1945. This would be when forces were surrendered at Rhodes by General Major Otto Wagner, the former stab chef of the SA and the war criminal who had slaughtered the ancient Jewish population of Rhodes. Nearly 10,000 Italians, Britons, and Commonwealth troops were killed or wounded, and over 44,000 Italians were captured. Hundreds had been massacred by the Germans and hundreds more drowned by the Allied strikes against POW-carrying vessels. The Luftwaffe had cost the Allies 113 aircraft, 6 destroyers, 3 submarines, and 10 coastal vessels. One cruiser was crippled, and three cruisers and four destroyers were severely damaged. The Luftwaffe had proven that naval supremacy meant nothing without air supremacy, a lesson that should not have to have been taught this far into the war. Thank you for joining me in this video, Victory in the Dodecanese. I also want to give a big shout out, of course, to my Patreon patrons and YouTube members, if you're not a channel member, at least make sure that you subscribe and hit the bell for notifications because there's a couple of neat things coming up, including the part four of the Luftwaffe at Sea, which really this and that are companion videos. I did notice that as I'm going through the video, sometimes I use the Greek pronunciation, sometimes the Italian. Uh, the islands are Lero and Ku in both Italian and Greek, but in English it's Leros and Kos. Uh, so forgive that if that got confusing at any point. I look forward to your comments, and I really appreciate your viewership. So do check out, if you haven't seen it, my video on the Italian war machine. And of course, there was a video I did earlier about the Italo-Greek war and the Greek campaign. Check that out. I am planning on making that a narrated video. It is all text at the moment. Until then, this is Claire, and I am the Warbird Mistress. Take care.